Hey, what's happening, everybody? Pastor Matt Stokes coming to you this morning with a short morning meditation. I changed my routine this morning, so I tried something different. I was reading something about the first minutes when you wake up, they say are some of the most creative moments in your day because your subconscious is actually entering into the conscious state, and that is a perfect time to try to get into state if you're trying to write or create music and so I was kind of trying it today um, I thought it was helpful but I'm gonna keep at it and see what it does all that being said I actually got to the gym late and so I'm actually broadcasting this from Galloway and um, so I'm out here by the lake and uh, I can hear um, uh, uh, you know sparrows and robins and it's just a great way to begin the morning so oh hold on tight everybody Hold on tight. I'm going to see if I can get it bring come on the broadcast. It looks like it says he's adding. I sent a request to join. Yep. And I sent it back to say a request accepted. Yes. Hey. Yes. One sec. It's I'll got me at. Let me see if I can hear you better. Hang on tight. Can I hear, hear you? Oh, you're a little further. Frozen. In your side. My, there you are. Yeah, there you are. It's normal. Good morning. Am I normal? I'm still sideways on my phone. Oh man, I can't hear you that well. It's probably it's probably my fault. I just um, it does. It's not coming through loud. Uh, can you hear me now? Just a tiny bit. Just a tiny bit. Okay. But well, I'll you, talk loud. If you raise your hand, I'll stop talking and listen, and then you can chime in. Okay. I want really, okay. really wanted to try this, so I'm glad it's working. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 11, and we'll look at, we'll look at some of the stuff we're going to be talking about on Sunday. So um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we left off in verse 10. I'm going to ask Jesse to pray for us as we get started. When we left off last week on Sunday, we were talking about Paul writing to them, and he's saying, you know, he's thanking God for the fact that the comfort that he's received, he's able to give to others. And so, and also the affliction that he received is similar to the affliction that others have. So there's this commonality that we have in the way that we suffer, even though that we might suffer in different ways, it could have the same result in that it leads us to be able to comfort people in affliction and encourage people in affliction. And then he says, says, I don't want you to be in the dark about what happened to us. And he gives this real time example of being pressed beyond measure, beyond his own strength, feeling like he was on death row was how bad it got for Paul and his team. And then he says, but you know, God did this so we wouldn't rely on ourselves. We would rely on God who raises the dead and rescues in every dimension, past, present, and future. He has, and he is, and he will continue to deliver us as long as we need his deliverance. And so now we'll pick up in verse 11. Jess, why don't you pray for us and bring us into the passage? Okay. God, I thank you that you are our deliverer. You are our stronghold, our refuge. And Lord, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. I thank you for your power to deliver. I thank you for saving us because that was the greatest act of deliverance in the world where you died for us and you delivered us from sin. But Lord, as we go through these trials, we ask for your continual help. Be our strong tower that we run to and find safety. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jess. So let's look at this together and let's see what our thoughts are. Verse 11, he says, you also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So what's Paul saying there? Um, I believe what Paul is saying is this, there's been a remarkable deliverance that's happened. And not only has it happened by the grace of God, but it's also happened by the prayers of many of you, Corinthians. You've been praying for us in the midst of what was overwhelming circumstances. And what's happened is, is your prayer for us has actually led to the deliverance of us. And now because of that, we're able to give thanks and you're able to give thanks because we're all watching God work. 
and how marvelous is that and jesse a great place to really touch on the power of prayer and you know somehow jess right we believe like god is sovereign and he's in control of all things he works all things after the counsel of his own will and yet at the same time he's saying god did deliver us and it happened to be because you were praying and now we're all rejoicing and giving thanks together real quick Tell me some of your thoughts on prayer. Tell all of us your thoughts on prayer. I know that's like one of the most immense topics in the faith, but when you see a passage like this, what are some of the first thoughts that come to your mind? Yes, I, I, what comes to mind is the amount of times that Paul asked for prayer. That when he was in Colossians, he said, pray for us that it, God may open up a door to declare the word of God. Um, Paul, when he was in jail in Philippians, said, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. Um, Paul is constantly asking the church to pray for him. And Paul was someone who believed in the power of prayer. And as Christians, we should be able and we should ask for prayer when we're going through hardship, right? One thing, one thing that I like to do anytime I'm about to preach um, you know, or have a speaking event or have something where I need help in prayer for, I'll put a post out or I'll text people personally and say, please pray for me because I know that prayer is powerful. And I remember um, someone, uh, I believe Charles Spurgeon, um, he would have something called the boiler room. And when he would preach, he would have a group of people praying for him, crying out to God on his behalf. And Charles Spurgeon one night, one time had a dream and in the dream he God revealed to him in this dream that many of his conversions were through an old man who prayed for him day and night and knelt on the ground someone that he barely knew barely met but that labored in prayer for his ministry and that much of Charles Spurgeon's success was through this unknown kind of little known man who prayed for him and Charles Spurgeon often says that my success is because I tell people to pray for me and I thought about that, you know, in our lives, that we should be humble enough to ask for prayer. Um, and you talked about God's sovereignty. You know, God is sovereign, but we have that uh, call to obedience. And prayer is part of obedience because God tells us to pray without ceasing, right? In the same way, you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, God is so sovereign, so I wouldn't commit adultery. Or so, um, or you'd say God is sovereign, so committing adultery is okay. No, that doesn't mean that doesn't excuse you from breaking his command. So if you look at prayer as uh, something that God, he tells us to do, he doesn't suggest it as a good idea. He says, pray without ceasing as a command. Um, uh, Jesus said, um, you know, you have not because you ask not. So he tells us this um, as an act of obedience because um, it's important. You know, it's we can't move forward in life without getting our directions from God. We can't go forward in life without um, depending on the Holy Spirit. And prayer is the way that we come in alignment with God's assignment for our lives. Yeah, I, so good. And um, I'm seeing she and uh, I can see a little bit of, of correspondence coming in and she's saying a lot about prayer. Um, you know, we prayed for Sheehan for a long time, right? And Sheehan's heart was heavy. Um, with a cancer diagnosis and the concerns of a resurgence and we prayed and when she received that clean bill of health like we all rejoiced right mm -hmm. she was thankful and we were rejoicing why because somehow in the midst of that prayer and and, and directing our hearts towards heaven on behalf of Sheehan when that when that answer to prayer came in that particular way, it's like we all rejoiced in that moment. And somehow mm -hmm. that's sort of like what Paul's saying here. It's like, I was delivered. You prayed for me. Somehow God worked in conjunction with those things together. And what happens at the same time is, is, is that she rejoices and we give thanks for answered prayer, right? Or both yeah. happen, like she gives thanks and we rejoice. But somehow both of those things are happening. Um, so there's, you know, so another thing, we'll move on. Doing a study on Paul in the New Testament on prayer. I remember we were Thessalonians. I realized Paul never asked for prayer. Did you ever see that? He, I thought he did. He tells them to pray. 
Yeah, oh, your, yeah, he didn't say please pray for me. Your prayers will do, and I have been delivered because of your prayers. But he never says, please pray for me. He just takes it as an, a, a, a fact that he is being prayed for you know, <laughs> by the different, bless you, by I, the different I, churches. And I think I, that there's something to be said about that, you know. Um, I, I think there's seven different times he talks about prayer for himself and for the ministry. And each time, it's not necessarily a request it's a it's a it's an, a command or he's telling them because you prayed this is what has happened and i just think that that's remarkable um and uh one other thought jess that comes to me about the power of prayer is in acts when they're praying for peter to be released from prison and what happens um and the next thing you know peter and it says an angel actually looses the prison cell and guides peter to the house where they were praying and he knocks on the door a girl answers you know what her name was rhoda the best rhoda answers the door and she shuts the door and doesn't even believe that it's peter it must be a ghost like she wasn't even firmly convinced even though she was praying and yet you know i heard some one time a preacher say he said that the angel fetched Peter from prison, but their prayers fetched the angel from heaven. See what I'm saying? Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Daniel praying three times a day, and then the angel comes to him with a message. I mean, there's remarkable things that happen, and any great revival always has prayer attached to it, right? I've never heard any great revival that happened. And then when you read the histories of great revivals in America or in Europe or Scotland or England, people don't say prayer really wasn't a part of it. We were just kind of winging it. It's like, no, fervent prayer was always a part of it. And that's got to be mentioned. And it can't be mentioned enough is the concept of really entering into that relationship with God. And again, I think it's Ravenhill that said, you know, that, um, preaching is open to the few worship leading is open to the few but prayer is open to all so if you're looking yeah. to get involved in ministry i don't know children's ministry i don't know worship uh parking uh facilities uh you know administration hey just get involved in prayer you don't have to think any further and when you do become an administrator or you do become a sunday school teacher pray even more right yeah so, so do you want to read the next verse for us and we'll verse 12 yes for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted. Now, Dad, do I have to talk this loud the whole time or is this? Say it again. I'm, I'm kind of shouting because you said my audio is low. Is this, it's hard I to hear. I'm, I'm reading lips. It's, like, it's almost like you're on a regular phone and I'm trying to listen to it from a, a little distance. But I can hear you. All right. I'm going to shout then. But I'm wondering how loud I'm coming in through everyone else. Maybe someone listening. else can tell us in the correspondence yeah, you, and we'll see. Can you ask in the chat? Yeah, guys, through, tell okay? us please in the chat if how Jesse's coming through in terms of his volume. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. Yeah. So what's he saying there? He's saying our conscience is clear that when we came to you, we came to you in simplicity. We came to you in sincerity. And, and Jess, I'm thinking, why does he even have to say that? You know why he has to say that? Can you tell me why? False apostles were um, questioning his authority and saying he was a false teacher. So he's backing himself up here. Right. So a lot of times when you hear me say there were these false teachers or super apostles that were trying to usurp his leadership and you say, well, wh how do you get all of this about them cutting Paul down and saying he was a liar and saying that he was a deceiver? Well, biblical scholars pick up on that by the way he's defending himself in between the lines. Why does he say I didn't come to you with worldly wisdom? Because there were people accusing him of being sort of like a song and dance show that he really wasn't sincere. And he's saying, you know I was sincere when I was with you. I'm sincere right now when I write this letter to you, right? And he's trying to drive that point home. And I guess the thought we could just take for the meditation is how important it is to be sincere, how important it is to be transparent, how important it is to be vulnerable. Because you know who isn't? False teachers, right? 
They don't want, they want to isolate themselves. They want to show up on the scene and just use their impressive influential skills, their, their, their unique oration skills, um, their powerful intellect to persuade the people, but they're not coming with sincerity. They're not coming with authenticity. They're not coming in simplicity. They're coming with the song and dance with the dog and pony show so that everybody's wowed. And Paul saying, Hey, you know me, I was with you. I wrote that first letter to you. I have a clear conscience that when I came to you, that it was in sincerity and it was in simplicity, right? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, God loves honesty. And honesty is one of the most important things you can have with God. You know, if you have honesty, you have intimacy. If you have honesty, you can have intimacy. If you don't have honesty with God, you cannot have intimacy with God. The Bible says in 1 John that if we walk in the light as he is the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. You see, the way that we walk in the light is by confession and honesty and that, that pure heart. Those are the ones that see God. And so when you walk in honesty, you obtain the kingdom of God. You see, if you read the Beatitudes, it says that the poor in spirit, the meek, um, the hungry and thirsty, right? I believe that the honest is very much attached to all of those Beatitudes because honesty is the opposite of pride. Pride is um, putting on hypocrisy. And if you think of the warnings that Jesus gave to hypocrisy, they were the strongest warnings he ever gave in the word of God, Matthew 23 is a perfect place where Jesus condemns and and confronts the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and says, woe to you. Outwardly, you are, you're like a whitewashed tomb. On the outside, you're, you're power washed. You're, you're a clean tomb, but inside you're full of dead bones. And so if we want to avoid um, the traps of the devil, if we have that honesty and sincerity before God and before others, we have done well. So we, God doesn't need us to be perfect. He wants us to be honest, though. David wasn't perfect. He was honest. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. Right. It makes me think of that verse that says, um, blessed are the pure in heart, right? Yeah. For they shall see God. Well, who's, who's more pure in heart than the one that's willing to admit my heart isn't pure, right? Which David does. And he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Like, he sins, but there's an honesty and there's a confession when he's confronted with that, right? And um, I'm thinking about um, what were you just saying about the honesty? Oh, just that that like that has to be part of your pedigree. That has to be part of your calling card. People are have had enough with phony, right? Yeah. And so if you have great presentation skills and you have um, um, great um, uh, debating skills and you can actually win an argument, but off the scene you are not sincere, you're not vulnerable, you're not transparent it calls into question the rest of your ministry, right? So that's why Paul here is trying to say, hey, look, what does he say there at the end? He says, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, that's our manner of life, in the world and more abundantly towards you. So what he's saying is, hey, when I was in the world operating as the tent maker, traveling through Macedonia and Achaia and through the regions of Greece, I was the same guy when I stopped by Corinth and sat with you and spent time with you and loved you and wrote that first letter to you. I'm the same guy. And what he's doing is he's trying to put the stamp of validity on his ministry to say, you know me, right? So that, how powerful and how important that is for all of us in, um, in terms of being able to say, you know me and you know my consistency and how that actually validates your ministry. And we're not just talking about ministers here, right, Jess? We're talking about anybody that wants to have an authentic spiritual influence of Christ in the life of other people. Yeah. So how about we read one more and then we'll, and then we'll finish it up. How about, thir how about Jess? How about, um, how about 13 through 15? Can you read those three verses? For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you also will understand even to the end. And also you have understood us in part that we are your boast as you also are us in the day of the Lord 
Jesus. You know what? We'll probably stop there because he goes into another. Um, he goes into stop another um, concept in fifteen. But in, mm -hmm. in 13 there and 14, he's talking about his letter, right? And basically what he's saying is, is that, you know, my letter's real. There's no hidden messages here. There's no hidden meanings. There's no hidden agenda. What I'm writing to you is exactly what I mean and what I've said. And then he says, and you also have um, acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's always pointing to this day called the day of the Lord Jesus. It shows up in the Corinthian messages. It shows up in the Thessalonian messages. Peter writes about the day of the Lord because it seems like, uh, not just seems like, it is true that there's going to come a day called the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, we realize it's actually called the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. When everything that was in the dark is going to be brought into the light. What did Jesus say in the gospels, right? What is whispered in the, in the secret will be what? Shout from the rooftops right and so like he's saying that um there's there's a discrepancy between what i'm saying and what these false so-called super apostles are saying but you know my letter you know my sincerity i've got no hidden agenda here there's no reading between the lines to find some secret thing i'm trying to say i'm being totally forthright with you and god's going to show you and the world that on the day of the lord jesus christ and there's a rejoicing in the fact that he knows that his conscience is clear and that the lord is going to be his vindicator right any thoughts on that as we finish those last few verses I just love how Paul was so relational. He said, my boasting is you and your boasting is me. That at the end of the day, um, Paul said that in another place that um, you are our epistle. You are a written epistle. You are our message. Like our, my fruit is your changed life. And you see, as believers, um, what we need to focus on is relationships and having relationships with people that we help them come to Christ, making disciples. At the end of the day, Paul did many great things, but his greatest thing was seeing someone become a baby in Christ to mature in Christ, from being lost to mature, not just lost to found, but lost to mature. And that's what Paul boasted in. He boasted in God using him to be a vessel to change other people's lives, to become more like Christ. Many people boast in different things. At the end of their life, you know, you go to a funeral and someone will say, you know, he was a really funny guy. He always made me laugh. Or, you know, he um, took me on a boating trip. Or he did this. And, you know, he, um, you know. He could bang he a nail with a hammer in one shot. Boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could, um, you know, spin a basketball on his finger. Uh, or all these things. And, and it's not bad to have those little, uh, you know, little tricks and tips and fun moments and memories, right? Um, but at the end of the day, Paul said, when I die, I have been someone that has been used and been investing in people and bringing people closer to Jesus. That's, that's my boast. At the end of the day, when I die, what I live for is to develop disciples. And when we kind of have that focus that like the horse with blinders on it i'm here to make disciples i'm here to have godly relationships to um have be intentional with my life to pour into people not just for the sake of hanging out and eating hamburgers but how am i going to have a christ-centered relationship um that's the key yeah. there and to be an example right. god god has called us to be examples for him and we're meant to have fun we're meant to enjoy life ecclesiastes talks about that but we're in a war, we're in a battle, and we're called to uh, make disciples, to teach others, to obey what God's commanded. And that's the most fulfilling thing. I, I've had more fulfillment in my life. I've been away from the Lord. Uh, some of you know my testimony in high school. I had a lot of fun doing different, um, you know, just hanging out. But the conversation was going nowhere. I wasn't making, there was no spiritual progress. And now my life, um, you know, I don't hang out as much in the sense of just sit sit down and watch TV with people. But now the time I spend with people, it's focused on Christ. And it's 10 million times more fulfilling than uh, my life before.
because it right. has a purpose. Right. Yeah. It's interesting, and we'll finish here, but, you know, what do you want people to say at your funeral, right? Do I want them to say, man, I really dug Matt's haircut. Um, he really, I like the way that, you know, I really liked, he kept his car so clean, right? It's like, oh my gosh, is that the legacy you're leaving? Is your haircut and your car, right? And, and how pretty your landscape was in the front of your house? Or do you want to hear things about someone's character, right? Or their nature, how they were other-centered, how they always took the time to listen, and how they always took the time to try to understand my, my thoughts and what was going on in my heart. They always wanted to offer wise counsel that came from Christ in the scriptures, like, when I leave this earth, that's what I want to leave people, right? It's not an overwhelming impression of me, but an overwhelming impression of Christ through me, right? That's Servant right. of the Lord. And so I think that's what Paul's really, um, really highlighting here, if you will. Um, even though he's highlighting his ministry, he's really pointing to Jesus. He's like, it's not by words of wisdom of my own. It's not by worldly, fleshly wisdom. It's by the grace of God that I communicate these things to you, right? Amen. Yeah. So great. So we'll wrap it up. I'm glad we were able to make it through. This is our first time experimenting and finally succeeding to this. I think now I understand why uh, sometimes I watch people do podcasts like remote and they're wearing earbuds. And I'm like, why is he wearing earbuds in this podcast? But this might be why, because in certain applications, they want to be able to hear the person I mean, I've always wondered that. If anybody else has a theory on that, please throw it into the chat because I always wonder why I see people wearing earbuds in a podcast that goes like this, right? It might be because of the audio or some feedback or whatever. But God bless you guys. Thanks for tuning in with us. Jess, why don't you pray for us and then we'll close out our time together. Oh. Okay. Father God, thank you that you deliver us from death. Thank you that you deliver us from hardship. Thank you, Lord, that... You call us to be honest. Thank you that, Jesus, you're honest with us because you shared the truth with us even when it's hard. So help us to speak the truth to others, to love you more. Thank you for your love for us, Lord, and help us to um, continually uh, make disciples, Lord, uh, reach lost people, and equip the church, Lord, and be who you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. In Jesus' name, Jesus amen. Name. Hey, thanks everybody so much for tuning in with Jesse and I in this morning meditation. And um, if you want more information that has to do with this particular application, Sunday morning, Coastal Christian, 930 is when the start time comes. And where is it, Jess? 2577 Tilton, Tilton Road, Road. EHT. So, um, Jesse might come on. He's usually almost always on on a Saturday doing something. But as for me, I thought I'd throw in today for the Second Corinthians preview so that it might be a nice appetizer you could send to someone. I'll probably talk about those false teachers, too, or those, uh, you know, super apostles. And what, uh, what would I say? The, the fault finding they were trying to do in the life of Paul and talk about the application of how do we handle fault finders that are in our vicinity, right, that are in our atmosphere? How do we handle them when we have them in our home, when we have them at work? Um, are they in the church? <laughs> so hopefully you'll be there for Sunday morning and we'll talk more about it then. Um, again, 930, 2577, um, Tilton Road and EHT. And we look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>